whose art? I know. Well, and I, I'm speaking less on art theory and more on like, like, the theory of beauty and aesthetics mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. stuff. So I, I wish I would have phrased it different because I feel like more people Maybe can, yeah. yeah, can yeah. come and it because it's not just about drawing. It's Correct. about you know, recognizing beauty for what it actually right. is and what biblical beauty is. So. Okay. Well, talking at this part of ACCS this summer, because we had a breakout lunch just for art. Oh, yes. There were 10 of us. Oh, my gosh. Me for the and, whole conference. Yeah, me and nine other ladies. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, I guess we'll just get started. So yeah. I'm going to pray. So please pray with me. Um, Heavenly Father, just thank you for the gift that is art. Thank you for the gift that is beauty. Um, Lord, I, I ask that you um, pre prepare our hearts to recognize beauty in the day-to-day, -day, God, and you give us conviction where we're dismissing um, the beauty around us, Lord, and uh, I pray that we can instill that in those around us and in our students as we disciple them, and uh, Lord, I pray that um, the beauty that we show them can um, draw them closer to you, and I pray this in your name. Amen. Amen. Okay, well, since we'll be discussing beauty... Um, I thought I'd start by showing you the most beautiful thing in the world, which is my son, who is six and a half months there old. He <laughs> there he is. He's just as cheesy as these pictures show. Always smiling. He's getting around now. Um, he is absolutely a joy. He's the greatest thing that's ever happened to us. So it has given us a new idea of what, what beauty is. We have a completely different perspective now. Beauty demands for itself at least as much courage and decision as do truth and goodness. And she will not allow herself to be separated and banned from her two sisters without taking them along with herself in an act of mysterious vengeance. And that's Hanzers von Balthasar in the glory of the Lord. Developing a biblical understanding of beauty in our students requires us as educators to acknowledge a biblical framework of beauty as well. In order for students to hold such conviction, we as educators must teach in a manner consistent with these beliefs across all disciplines. As educators, we must acknowledge the present danger of relativism in order to fully acknowledge the Lord's sovereignty over beauty. We must be sure this sensitivity toward beauty is viewed as imperative throughout all disciplines in order for its relevance to be applicable within the visual arts. Throughout all of history, we see confusion and discrepancies in man's attitude toward beauty and the formula on which its evaluation rests. As classical Christian educators, we strive to educate around the frameworks of truth, goodness, and beauty. Often we teach with confidence through the scripture of truth and goodness, yet the idea of beauty or visual aesthetic is a little more ambiguous within our train of thought. Heidi Stevens says it best, in her article, The Necessity of the Visual Aesthetic in Classical and Christian Education, when she states that, while we would never leave truth or goodness to flounder in such a lack of definition, we're suspicious that beauty lies, inscrutably as the world has taught us, in the eye of the beholder, and that we have little right to wrest it from its comfortable place there. We must not limit the Lord's power by assuming visual aesthetic is out of his providence. While striving to educate well-rounded students, it is crucial to avoid teaching truth and goodness too heavily if it is at the expense of teaching beauty. The three are interdependent and implied in one another, and therefore must be approached with equal importance within the classroom. Beauty is a jealous sister and will take the other two down if she is ignored. We must surrender any relativism we have allowed to slip into our worldviews before we expect students to reconcile with absolute truth to which the Lord has called us. With the rise of the empirical method, the unknown became the impossible, and the immeasurable surrendered its will to irrelevance. If something cannot be tangibly measured, it is thought not to be certain, leading us to the relativist belief that beauty is in the eye of the beholder. This false understanding of beauty has allowed our society to view beauty as expendable, Taking a back seat. Taking a back seat to function. We see this in the rise of brutalist architecture midway through the last century, which consisted of these concrete structures stripped down to bare form for functionality as a reaction to the architecture from the previous generation. 
Beauty feeds our souls. It feeds our souls. The artist Makoto Fujimara uh, wrote this in his booklet on becoming generative, and I guess it's also in culture care, but I haven't read that, so I would like not to quote something I haven't read. Um, but I would like to read you this story that he writes. As a newlywed couple, my wife and I began our journey with very little. After Judy and I got married in the summer of 1983, after college, we moved to Connecticut for Judy to pursue her master's degree in marriage counseling. Ta I taught at a special education school and painted at home. We had a tight budget and often had to ration our food, lots of tuna cans, just to get through the week. One evening, I sat alone, waiting for Judy to come home to our small apartment, worried about how we were going to afford the rent to pay for necessities over the weekend. Our refrigerator was empty and I had no cash left. Then Judy walked in with a bouquet of flowers. I got really upset. How could you think of buying flowers if we can't even eat? I remember saying, frustrated. Judy's reply has been etched in my heart for over 30 years now. We need to feed our souls, too. The irony is that I am the artist. I am the one supposedly feeding people's souls. But in worrying for tomorrow, in the stoic responsibility I felt to make ends meet, to survive, I failed to be the artist. Judy was the artist that day. She brought home a bouquet. I do not remember what we ate that day, or that month, probably tuna fish, but I do remember that particular bouquet of flowers. I painted them. We need to feed our souls too. Those words still resonate with me today. And I tried to find a picture of that bouquet of flowers that he painted, and I could not find, so I put this one instead. <laughs> Now I'd like to pause the presentation for a moment because I think it would be valuable for us to answer some of these questions collectively. So where do you see that society has abandoned the need for beauty in everyday life? Where do we see it? I would say like city structures mm -hmm. are so bland and when you see like a city like care about something, yeah. it, it automatically pops out. And I, like in airports, there are just, for whatever reason, there are some pieces in airports that make me go, that make me stop, and then in some ways also realize the blandness of everything else yeah. that they have created. So, I don't know, just like in city structure and things like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think it's just so easy for us to just become obsessed with what we call efficiency. And I think in his book, Culture Here, he says, um, he says it can, be, it can be so easy for us to survive, but that doesn't mean we're flourishing. Mm -hmm. Because we, we become obsessed with efficiency and we forget that we're draining ourselves of what makes life worth living. Yeah. Yeah, that's good. That's good. I think it, I, mean, I, I agree with the question as a whole, but um, we, we are so lambasted with image after image after mm -hmm. image mm -hmm. that I think we kind of lost our understanding of what real Real beauty, beauty actually is. is. Anyway, we just we've been so oversaturated with mm. image after image. That's good, yeah. Um, you know, and I'll admit, admit when you threw up the brutalism architecture, I'm like, oh, that's cool, honey, because I do. I respond. Right. Positive. I respond positively to that. But mm. <laughs> yeah. Um, so where do we see aesthetic relativism in society? Yeah, I took I took a, an online class with Mama. Hmm. Basically, they were just talking about translating the methodology that they're using in the, in the museum to the classroom as far as when students come in and, and are doing like a close looking exercise. Mm -hmm. um, but the whole premise of what they were trying to do was based on, on relativism and the mm -hmm. fact that it, it doesn't matter what the real meaning of that painting is, it doesn't really matter what the artist meant for it to be. Mm -hmm. You as a child or whoever you are, you get to bring your own unique vision and, mission and you know, meaning to that painting and it's just as relevant or as important mm -hmm. as to what the artist initially meant or not. Mm. I'm like, no, that's not true. But then, <laughs> but then you see artistic statements where artists will present a work and they'll, they'll tell you, well, you know, I just don't really have any significant mm. or, or specific meaning behind it. It's up to the viewer. And I'm like, well, then basically you're saying it's meaningless. Right. And, uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. I think I know, um, I know like in the art world people are just so skeptical to talk about beauty in a direct sense because they think in an 
inevitably becomes totalizing and mm. offensive. Mm. And that, like, they're inevitably going to be silencing people in, like, different contexts. And yeah. I think it assumes that having an understanding of, like, a robust understanding of truth, goodness, and beauty is going to lead to us oppressing people. But nobody, like, nobody's willing to believe that it's possible to ground it in something that's actually life-giving. And then, mm. like, in a larger story that can actually fit all the different stories inside of it. And I think that's why it's significant to ground our understanding of beauty in Christian theology, because I think it's life-giving enough that it can invite people from every tribe, mm. tongue, and nation. You know, it, we don't have to give in to relativism sure. to invite different contexts and to discuss beauty. And that's a hard conversation for us to have sometimes mm. when they have not seen that right. from us. Right. right. But the best way to start that conversation is by making beautiful art yeah. ourselves, because yeah. we witness to the beauty of the kingdom in doing so. Mm. That's good. Um, so where do we see aesthetic relativism within the church? And that could be um, Universal Church, capital C. <laughs> um, and I mean, me and you talked about this earlier, but specifically within evangelicalism, um, the, the idea that beauty is, it, it, it can't be talked about in a concrete sense in that, like, the empirical method, therefore, that means that, like, because it can't be talked about in a concrete sense, it's irrelevant. Mm -hmm. I think we've, in part, accepted its irrelevance, and so you'll hear specifically Protestants talking about church buildings, and they're like, yeah, that, it's just a building, mm -hmm. and so we end up meeting in warehouses, <laughs> you know, and so, but what a great opportunity we have to make our place of worship beautiful, because that is a witness to the beauty of God's kingdom. Yeah. But because we don't see beauty as something valuable and as something significant, we lose that opportunity. And so, and it's it's interesting because inevitably our church buildings end up looking like a Walmart. <laughs> yeah. And so it's like we're not different from the rest of our culture at all. Right. I think so. But even when when there is at least an acknowledgement that we need to do something aesthetically mm -hmm. pleasing with this space. Yeah. It very rarely, if ever, goes beyond just the sense of decor. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, we, we never get across that threshold mm -hmm. in, into really art and its ability, um, you know, to, to have an effect on, on people as they yeah. come into place like, of worship. Yeah. Like, what role could beauty play in discipleship? Mm -hmm. I mean, we'll talk about truth and goodness in raising up Christians, but what does it mean to give Christians a proper taste of beauty? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I missed the first part, so I may be off here. But no, you're great. Don't we sometimes see it the opposite, too, that a church wants to make, like, worship beautiful and then take it so far that it's distracting and mm. it's not mm. true worship, but yeah. since it's beautiful for them and it works for them, then there's no line to draw a hard truth and say, well, biblically, we don't see that we need to be putting on a huge concert or show. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's true. <laughs> um, and, I, and I was a part of a local congregation in which most of the musicians and vocals, that was their job mm. as far as Monday through Friday and then Sunday, you know, but it still felt the same. Mm. What they were doing in the week and on Sunday didn't feel any different than what was happening in their venue. Mm. And that's something I struggle with too. Mm -hmm. Like there's, a, there's this weird balance of like, this becomes a production of mm -hmm. in some way, yeah. like, and and in some ways my pendulum swings. Just put a guy up there with a guitar, cut the the lights and the fog right. machines, right, and help me focus wholly, sure, on, you know, on the worship. But um, my dad, what what um, at a church in Kansas City, and primarily a younger church within the downtown area, he had so many artists. And it was so interesting to see from a younger church how he was uh, encouraging the creation of art within the foyer of the church mm -hmm. and throughout the church. And that has been something I've not really ever seen is, is um, within the church, young men and women being a part of that and the, the, that creation of art, which is sometimes, which I almost... I don't know my art very well, but it's, it was no, different good. than a decoration right. that I went and bought at Party City sure. right. compared to a six-by-six six 
you know, painting of, of spreading seeds. And, um, mm. I, I still remember those mm. paintings, and they, yeah. they still have an impact on me. So, yeah, it's something I definitely struggle with, with, with mm. knowing that line between the production, but also the decorum and the aroma of right. those things. Mm -hmm. I, I think the distinction, like every church is going to have a liturgy because we're habitual beings, and that's just how we grow. Um, and so a lot of like Protestants are like, and I'm a Protestant saying this. It's like we're all we're very skeptical of the idea of like kneeling in a church service, of doing congregational prayers, of taking of the sacraments. But other churches, their liturgy is people turning knobs throughout the entire service, and there being lights and fog. So every church is going to have a liturgy, and mm -hmm. so I wonder what it looks like to try That's to write true. more. Um, or like edifying elements of a liturgy because I think they have so much room for art. You know, I think um, like the church calendar opens up so many different ways for us to use visual art mm -hmm. throughout the church year. So yeah, that's good. That's good. So as believers, we hold to the truth that beauty is manifested through Scripture. We believe that when God created the world, he saw that it was good, as stated in Genesis 1. We believe that we, <clears throat> being made in the image of God, have the ability to create by appropriating what he has already made good. We believe that what is good and what is beautiful always point back to the nature and characteristics of our triune God and what has been created, what he has created. Because of this, we must filter all critiques through a sieve constructed by these beliefs. Now this does not mean that beautiful art must be inherently Christian by subject. Art can reflect attributes of God without a blatant depiction of sacred scenes. Because nature itself is graced, all things point to the Trinity. Jerome Bars, so am I saying that right? Jerome Bars, <laughs> notes in his book, Echoes of Eden, that there are no secular topics. Because all of creation belongs to God, it may be used as artistic expression. This is even true of the brokenness and fallenness of the world. Such themes point to truth and bring glory to God as they draw us to our hope for redemption. The same can be said for songs and psalms of lament. Look at the anguish and humanity of this piece right here and allow it to remind you of your former or present suffering. Allow it to propel you toward the need for a savior. I love the agitated lines of all of her pieces. Mm. So wonderful. She's a phenomenal figure artist. I thought there was one that you wanted to say something about yeah. in our critiques. I, I missed what you were saying. Um, in our critiques. Um, critiques of art, we must filter all of the, our critiques of art through a sieve constructed by the, the beliefs that, um, that he has already made all that is good. And Mm -hmm. Furthermore, this does not mean that we should dismiss art that has the appearance of, of abstraction. Even abstract art can point to the truth and goodness through their composition. In Ecclesiastes 1, we are told that there is nothing new under the sun. This means that, artists, that as artists, we have free reign to create, and yet we are limited to and bound by what the Lord has already created. All creative thought is inspired by what is already created. Even abstract art, like this Kandinsky, can point to the characteristics of God. We're going to come back to this piece in a second, so remember this piece. <laughs> These visual characteristics of God have been secularized into what artists now refer to as the principles of design. These artistic principles allow components within a composition to work cohesively, creating pieces that are visually pleasing. The success of these artistic principles is made possible by the predetermined success of each principle within the character of God. So for instance, we see harmony, unity, and balance within the character of the Trinity. We see emphasis as it is placed on Christ throughout scripture and in reality. We see repetition manifested in the consistent and unchanging nature of God. And we see rhythm and movement exhibited as the Lord is constantly working in the world and within us. 
Without reference to biblical truth, these artistic principles have no rationale for why they are necessary to a composition, and they become, by modern definition, arbitrary. So, going back to this Kandinsky piece, um, I would like to hear from you guys and um, how you see the principles of design working together to bring glory to God in this piece. when I look at it, I, it seems to communicate like a sense of movement. Yeah. Um, and so it's dynamic. And I, and I think when you mentioned the, the rhythm and movement, <coughs> that kind of being um, connected to God's action and history, I think it also reminds me of just the dynamism of God's inner life as Trinity. as like Father, mm. Son, and Holy Spirit, that there's this, this constant movement between them. Just the, the interpenetration and the, the life giving that's been going on through all of eternity. Yeah. Um, Kandinsky, I don't know if you remember, I think we've talked about this before, but Kandinsky is the artist who um, claimed that he suffered from synesthesia so he could um, see music and hear paintings. So um, he would paint in a manner as if he were uh, listening to music. So. Mm. Um, so that's where the rhythm and the movement and, yeah. and the agitation comes from and the, the vibiness of it, so, yeah. Do you see you anything else? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And there are a couple more I left out, but. <laughs> you haven't memorized them? <laughs> Something I love too is um, the the emphasis where everything is just bringing into the center, and I mean, I love that it creates a triangle too, which um, just further brings me to um, think of the Trinity and just how the I feel like the Lord is exclaiming His His glory through through this piece, be because of where the emphasis lies. So. And there's a clear balance between the the curvilinear lines and forms. Oh, absolutely. The straight, you know, I think he strikes a really strong balance between those two. I guess Very I just much so. I feel like I feel like I'm a, a little. And JJ is probably not the right word, but just but just knowing his background as far as the sense CJ, if, if I would still get that sure. without that information, I I hope and think I would. I mean, for me, like the this, this his clearly, synesthesia, like yeah, that part of it, right, right. sure. Without bringing that known entity to the to the work, sure. and, mm -hmm. but I think there's enough evidence there that maybe I, I would still come to that conclusion without that knowledge. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, there's there's so many strong musical elements within this kind of composition. Right. Um, I think what an interesting like parallel between that, that. So it's like we look at this piece, and it's like somebody looking at it without knowing about his synesthesia, or like they might see it, and they might just dismiss it as like some chaotic work. But when they hear, of like, of that's what he was trying to do when he was mm -hmm. making the piece, they come to understand it in a more fuller way. And that when we're talking about the principles of design, when we hear the proclamation that in Christ all things hold together, that parallels to that. And that then we look back at creation yeah. and we look back at art and then we see the, the beauty of the Trinity mm. in this piece. You know what I mean? It's because we've been given that information that's kind of the ultimate authorial intent that sure. all things point to the glory of Christ. Mm. Then we can come to fully understand it. I think mm. like the two are very connected. So. Mm. Anything else? So how then shall we train these artistic minds? So by teaching the principles of design through the biblical framework of beauty, students obtain a sound understanding that beauty is not in the eye of the beholder. And this will help students understand art as a discipline that requires devoted labor. Skills in art can be cultivated. It requires devotion and hard work. The studio component in governmental art programs has fallen victim to the relativ relativism of the present age, as students are encouraged to express themselves as an end rather than as a means to the end. While I agree that studio art can be a successful vehicle for self-expression, I believe that there is an appointed time for everything. 
and students must learn the tools to effectively convey their concepts and ideas before successfully captivating an audience. More importantly, I would like students to take time to develop ideas worth conveying before they jump into the narcissistic and entitled realm of the arts. When I was studying ceramics in college, everyone felt that they had something very important to say. <laughs> and we see it today. Everyone thinks they have something very important to say. I would like to take time to train students in how to think and form opinions so that by the time they have the good foundation of skill, they will know what the message is that they are actually wanting to convey. Bars put it like this. He writes, the more inward and purely self-expressive art becomes, the more inaccessible it is to others. For artistic communication to occur, art cannot simply be an expression of the self. True art must have some contact with life, with reality, with other people who exist alongside the artist. C.S. Lewis puts it something like this, great writing, and all great art, exist because there is a world not created by the writer. I love that. So, here's Kollowitz again, lover. By training students to attain artistic skill, they are trained to see with visually disciplined eyes and struggle through artistic endeavors. In doing this, they learn to admire the physical beauty demonstrated to us through God's creation and its complexity. So how do we cultivate these visually disciplined eyes? Drawing is a teachable subject. Artistic talent can be a developed skill. And the book that I have found is the most useful resource when it comes to lessons and um, methodology is uh, this book right here, Drawing with Children by Mona Brooks. Um, I picked this book up at the ACCS conference a few years ago and have absolutely loved it. Um, she gives many practical exercises and tips regarding um, just what steps to take in getting kids familiar and comfortable with drawing. I have the book up here if you'd like to look through it later. But um, In her book, she debunks the theory that true artists draw from imagination only. In fact, many great artists worked under other artists in their early years. Even artists who were later devoted to abstraction studied under representational artists. As we know, Jackson Pollock, along with his brother, studied under Thomas Hart Benton before his well-known drip painting technique. In teaching art, we need to start at the basics. As with all disciplines, we have to have a solid foundation. So in my class, I felt like I put an unhealthy pressure upon myself by thinking that every activity done in class must yield some sort of completed project. Um, but because artistic skills are developed over time, it is near impossible for successful projects to be completed every week. There are exercises, though, that can be done in class that prepare students and refine their skills for future projects, not just in the current class that they're in, but in future classes to come. So here are a few different exercises and activities um, that I have used in class that don't necessarily yield a finished product, and yet they cultivate students' artistic skill. The first one is master studies. Master studies are an excellent exercise for students, and they do not stifle creativity. They don't. There is nothing wrong with students studying the technicality of other artists. There is nothing wrong with imitating their work in order to develop skill. So I created these worksheets for my students to complete during wise time in their homeroom classes or when they finish proje projects. These projects were to be done on their own time and allowed them to take time to notice detail and structure of various paintings throughout history. So on the, on the um, handouts, I would put a copy of the original work and um, then, this is very high tech, I googled free art history coloring pages and I made the dimensions the same and then I um, put another thumbnail that was of the same dimensions down below so that they were able to, to see the basics of the lines and to, to copy and um, just better like, understand. Like an early finishers? Yeah, this was a more, and then, right. yes, and then they could take some if they wanted to do it during wise time in their sure. homeroom classes. Here's another one I did. No, that's fine. I showed pictures of my baby at the beginning, so you're good. I love having your baby in here. <laughs> Drawing exercises. So, coupled with the master studies, I have taken several exercises from previous drawing classes that I have taken and, re and have rewritten them to fit the various age groups within the grammar stage. Mona Brooks also touches on these exercises in her methods. 
So these include negative space studies, mirror imaging techniques, upside down still lifes, copying line drawings upside down. So negative space studies. They challenge students to see, they challenge students to view the space around the object at hand, studying the different shapes these void spaces create. And this allows students to develop a better understanding of spatial relations within the composition. They begin to understand how all pieces work together in a composition and how they all relate to one another, existing in the same space. So these were really fun. After you got past all of the complaining of how hard it is and how they don't look good when you're done, it's actually a pretty fun <laughs> activity to do. Um, this is a, a very common one. This is in most art, art education books. It's the, is it a face, is it a vase study. Um, and they allow younger students to become more comfortable with symmetry and allow older students to pay attention to detail using both sides of the brain, etc. Um, I didn't have a picture for this one because I feel like it's pretty self-explanatory. You can take a chair and put it upside down on a table and um, have students draw it. So by putting it upside down, students um, disassociate the object from its function and its form in the brain so they're able to draw it for what it actually looks like rather than what they know it is supposed to look like. Um, bicycles especially are good for this. Um, and again, once you get past the this is hard, I don't want to do this type attitude, it's very fun and um, actually yields some pretty incredible results. Upside down line drawings are similar to the upside down still life as far as what they accomplish. Um, however, I would give the students a line drawing and have them turn it upside down before copying it. Therefore, they would no longer see these as flowers. They would see them as um, different shapes working alongside of each other to create a composition. So these techniques are not limited to just the art room and they can be used in class during wise time activities or sent home as home studies. Um, a lot of times students would ask for homework and art. Can I do something at home? And I'm like, you can always just draw at home. You can always do something at home. But these were um, great activities that I would just send home with them and then they'd come and we would discuss them as if they were getting a grade on it. But I appreciated their zeal. So, um, so oftentimes before intro introducing a new project as a class, we would spend a couple days doing copy activities or matching activities, allowing students to refine their attention to detail. These activities can be symbols drawn on large graph paper that students could work on independently or with a partner discussing the variations they see. So these are copy activities. And what I would do is create a design in the box and then have them copy it over to the other side, starting at, usually I would have them start at one corner and work their way out so they don't miss a single line. Um, and some of these are listed in the Mona Brooks method as well. She talks a lot about these. And then matching activities would be similar to what you would find in a highlights magazine, very basic things that yield wonderful skill. Um, you would have multiple illustrations all with slight differences and they're required to match which ones are the replicas. And then another variation of that would be to have all of them be the same and have one picture have slight differences and they pick the one that does not match. Um, again, it's just training their eyes to to pay attention to the details so that when they, when they do see a piece of art, they're able to um, better point out things, whether it's something going on in the background or um, the structure of someone's face, they're able to point those things out because they're training their eyes to see those type of detail. So figure drawing is probably one of my favorite things to study with students. And we started as early as first grade. First through third grades, we used a lot drawing mannequins a lot to deal with proportions, and we talked about how to use your pencil to measure different proportions if you hold it out in front of you. Um, and we also, I would make packets of proportions uh, as we studied proportions of the face and portraiture. And students as young as first grade were able to make some pretty, pretty awesome portraits, actually. And then by the time they got to fourth grade, we would work on timed gesture drawings and realistic self-portraits. And it's amazing what the fourth grade through sixth graders were able to do if they had had that early training in first through third grade. We're able to just build upon each other. Um, and again, these don't just stay in the art room. With the homeroom class, students can have this attention to detail as they draw their observations in their science journals, um, as they illustrate poems, illustrate something for book reports, all of those things. But with this, homeroom teachers, too, should be urged to have the same high standard and ensure that students aren't rushing through their work. Um, beauty should be universal within the school. Uh, and craftsmanship takes time, and, and it is important. Mm -hmm. So um, to close, I have a few more discussion questions that I'd love for us just to 
um, to chat about. So uh, we talked about the principles of design. So what are other ways that you see the principles of design reflecting the beauty of God? What are some characteristics that you can see overlap with the principles of design and um, add to their validity? You want me to put the principles of design back up? Oh, I, I pulled it up. I'm good. Oh, you, you got I'm it. Sure. <laughs> 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 you sure you got the right set? Uh, well, uh, we'll find out. <laughs> we are not all agreed. <laughs> pointing to God's activity in creation. So it's like in God's works, like in the economic trinity, like we see these points, but also like in God's imminent life, I think every single one of them can point to just the imminent life of the trinity, how we mm -hmm. see the harmony and unity in balance in each person of the trinity. How, you know, it's like they're distinct, but they're completely harmonious. Mm -hmm. um, and that repetition and that rhythm that's like asking what God was doing before creation is not a speculative question. We're told very directly what God is doing. You know, it's like there is the Father who's loving the Son and the Spirit and the Son. You know, and so it's there. It's just interchange of love. And I think all of these, they do point to God's activity in creation, but what they first and foremost point to is God's own inner life um, that he then shares with creation. And that's why, that's why they make sense. It's because hmm. they're, they come from God's inner life. Yeah. Hmm. That, is it perichoresis? What is yeah, like perichoresis, perichoresis yeah, that yeah. interpenetration yeah. between the three persons, yeah. Hmm. On what other basis can we evaluate art? Are there any other criteria for, for critique, for evaluation? I think like when, I think as Christians looking at art, like we really shouldn't be afraid to be super Christian. <laughs> and like the ways that we evaluate art, like I find hmm. something that's helpful is looking at different themes of the biblical narrative and how it really seems like good art is usually picks up on one of those themes, how if it's like celebrating the innate goodness of creation or if it's kind of um, mourning the brokenness of creation hmm. or if it's, it's honoring mm -hmm. the sacrifice that goes into protecting what's good in creation, or if it's pointing towards hope. It's like we see each of those um, kind of has a coherence as a part of the biblical narrative, because that's the story we were created for. And so naturally the art that we can resonate with is going to connect with the biblical narrative in some way. So I think like a distinctly Christian way to look at art, I think it would be connecting it to the biblical narrative. Hmm. And not necessarily character for character. Right. With then, your broader brush strokes as well. Right. right. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. yeah, it's like we were created for the themes we see in the biblical narrative. And so. Hmm. Yeah, I mean, my dad's been, I mean, we've been, we've been talking about movies in similar mm -hmm. ways. And just the overlap of the biblical narratives yeah. that we find within movies mm -hmm. and even in music as well. I yeah. mean, just even broadening you know, that scope that so often the movies that we love have mm -hmm. strong biblical narratives yeah. sure. because they resonate so deeply with us. And so it is funny because as a 30-year-old having this conversation mm -hmm. and having my dad articulate these things, I started to go back through the films that I so dearly love. Yeah. And I was going, oh my goodness, I, yeah. I, never, I, I hadn't thought of that when mm -hmm. I was in my teens or early 20s, but now coming back and having a deeper understanding of scripture and those things even made me love them more, like the, it even deepened yeah. as I, as I um, kind of thought back through those things, so that's good. Yeah, yeah. it's interesting how like loving Christ causes us to love creation all the more. Mm -hmm. Like the first time I had, like I talked about the biblical narrative appearing, like the first time I had a really in-depth conversation about that in the <laughs> Which seems absurd, no. but like, but I really like all of creation is grace, and that mm -hmm. it all, all of like the beauty we see in creation points in a certain way to Christ. My dad's 
for the same thing, but yeah, yeah, it's just good sacrifice. Yeah, and yeah, yeah. Mm. Totally. And as far as what other bases, I've always used Philippians four eight mm. as a concrete evaluation of my own work. Um, so when it says think about these things, I just replace the word with draw these things and paint these mm. things, sculpt these things. Yeah, that is good. That's very good. Um, so what are ways you think, I guess this, maybe it can, you can do it with your kids, but <laughs> so what are ways that you think that you could better cultivate the skill of drawing? And you may not, that may not be something you want to answer, but maybe just something to think about. I certainly know I don't have all the answers, but I hope that there were it, some nuggets that well, were helpful. The difficulty is that it, it, it is such a foundational skill. Sure. For everything else that they're going to do artistically. Mm -hmm. But but if that's what you did with them, mm -hmm. especially, you know, if that encompassed the bulk of what you did, they would riot. Right. You know, they yeah. really, 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 really would. And I, exactly. I mean, about that with my junior hires and high schoolers, too. Mm -hmm. I would love to do nothing more than take a whole semester and just sit down with you and work on drawing skills. Um, and that's not to say that we can't, but within the current structure that we have right it's really not possible mm -hmm. um not with freshmen through seniors all in one class right you know? unless there were a drawing elective or Correct. yeah Correct. But right then knowing that next year you're going to get a whole other group of freshmen who are going to join this group as mm -hmm. well yeah. so yeah I, i'd love to draw more <laughs> yeah or have them draw more it's tough um, so you're saying oh because you have ninth grade through 12th grade yeah okay yeah yeah yeah, yeah. it is tough Right. Well, and just different kids throughout all of the grades because they change electives. Yeah. Right. His is not quite as artistic, but but it still gets the point across. It sure. Kids saying, look, you know, uh, if you get it thirty percent of the way there, your brain will begin to recognize that that's what that's supposed to be. Mm -hmm. Now the artistic side of it is to develop that, that further. The detail, yeah. Yeah. Do you feel like classical Christian education would have a lot of potential then for training those drawing skills? Oh, absolutely. That, that just, like, that's just something I know so little about, but I feel like there's so much potential to cultivate those skills early on. Mm -hmm. Well, and I think, like, in teaching truth, goodness, and beauty, like, there really should be an emphasis put on, placed on the beauty if we're, yeah. if those are the three frameworks we're really wanting to, to teach on, like, then that should be of importance. That should be what, you know, mm -hmm. that. But even still, art production kind of rules. Right. You know, I mean, you'd love to, I would love to do more of the others and try to, but mm -hmm. what do we, you know, what do we make it today? Yeah, mm -hmm. that's the question. What are we making? Like, Great are, artists. What are we, what are we, what are we, yeah, yeah. What are we making? So it, it, yeah. Great it, it, it artists. Take time to, to yeah. change that. So. Sure. Yeah. yeah. I think it's like that with all disciplines, though. Students don't see that they're they're learning. They're seeing what mm -hmm. what they're doing. What's what's tangible. So, but well, anyways, thank you for for coming. <laughs>